farbiges, schönes Leben. Das ist unser Chemieprogramm in Aktion. You have maybe heard of big German companies such as Siemens and Bosch and tool manufacturers like Fein, Metabo, Knipex and many others. But have you ever heard of VEB Elektrowerkzeuge Sebnitz, VEB Werkzeugfabrik Radebeul or here it comes, VEB Spinnereimaschinenbau Karl Marx Stadt, Kombinat für Maschinenbauerzeugnisse der Natur und Chemiefaserspinnerei? Well, welcome to the reality of East Germany during the decades of the Cold War. We will encounter these long-stretched German word monstrosities throughout this video, as they were one of the distinct hallmarks of the culture of the GDR, or German Democratic Republic. In Germany abbreviated DDR or DDR, which is short for Deutsche Demokratische Republik. We will later see that of course there are shorthands and brand names for these long descriptive titles, but you probably haven't heard of those either. As a quick reminder, after Germany had been defeated in World War II, it was separated into occupation zones by the Allies. And a few years later, in 1949, the Soviet occupation zone was transformed into a state of its own. Even though smaller and much less populous than what would become West Germany, the GDR managed to build and maintain many industries on its own. Iron and steel manufacturing, car manufacturing, optics, electronics, computers, and many many other things. In this video we will focus mostly on the tool making sector and take care of a bunch of tools that I have been able to collect over the years. Now I didn't grow up in East Germany but the GDR is a source of endless fascination for me and no matter how often I think about it I can never quite get past the fact that one people was separated into two states which existed right next to each other yet they often ignored each other's existence both pretending to be the only real legitimate Germany. Endless things can be said about this topic and there are lots of historical documentaries about the Cold War. What I want to do is to talk about something that would be much harder to learn anything about for people in other countries and that is well actually seeing and working on products that were made in East Germany. So let's get going then. And here's a package that I bought on eBay, sight unseen, and it's supposed to contain an East German made toolbox filled to the brim with GDR tools, a time capsule if you will. So let's see what we got here. Now the box itself is clearly East German and what gives it away is this logo. But what does it show? It seems to have been painted over one too many times. Well on this green box here, which I also happen to own, we can see it much more clearly. It's a symbol of a bat with the letters B-A-T on top. Quite counterintuitively, this clearly English sounding name is a brand of products made in socialist East Germany, which often saw itself as an anti-capitalist and even anti-Western state. As far as I understand it, the brand name existed before the GDR was even founded and they simply ran with it. The official name of the factory that made these boxes is VEB Sturmlaternen Bayerfeld. In essence, it means Storm Lantern Factory at the town of Bayerfeld. And here is the next apparent contradiction. Naming a company in a very descriptive way after the product it makes leads to immediate irritation once the company makes more than one product. But let's see what's inside then. The first thing we find is an assortment of rusty wrenches. But I think we are lucky. This toolbox seems to be pure and uncontaminated by modern tools and western products. A time capsule indeed. And I proceed by taking everything out of the box. More wrenches, screwdrivers, hammers and chisels, pliers and all kinds of odds and ends that you would find in grandpa's toolbox. And we will have a closer look at these items in just a minute. First I will take care of the wrenches though. I remove superficial dirt with a piece of steel wool. I do this mostly to remove grease that could be in the way of removing the rust on some of these wrenches chemically. After doing that I prepare an acid bath by dissolving citric acid in warm water. All these wrenches and some of the other tools are put inside and left in there for a day or so. In the meantime we can have a look at another stash of wrenches that I had also bought a while ago. This is a treasure trove that I bought from a military surplus dealer. 
sometimes you can still find old East German objects in their inventories. In this case, we have an assortment of mostly unused wrenches from the stockpiles of the NVA, the East German Armed Forces. What might seem like rust is actually heavy grease that protected the wrenches from corrosion over the decades. Penetrating oil removes all that and in no time the wrenches look like new. Almost all of them were made at the same factory in a small town called Radebeul. The wrenches say WEFA or WFR, WFR, which is short for Werkzeugfabrik Radebeul, Tool Factory Radebeul. And again, everything is full of contradictions here. Some wrenches say DDR, others just say made in Germany as if there was only one Germany. The term super steel, obviously in English, seems to imply a willingness to export these tools internationally. All the while, they were owned by an army that was trained to fight against the West and thus parts of the English speaking world. And by the way, some of you will recognize these wrenches because even if they weren't exported back then, they have been exported now because I included all of these wrenches in the toolboxes I sold to you guys in recent months. In the meantime, the tools from inside the toolbox have been sitting in the acid bath, have then been brushed and rinsed off to be dried and then oiled with ballastol. So let's have a look at our findings. What we have is a mixture of marked and unmarked tools of different origin. The vast majority was once again made at the tool factory Radebeul though. All of these tools appear to be historic and almost all were probably made in East Germany. On some of the tools we find the brand name Smalkalda, named after the town Schmalkalden, and WMW or WMW in German. Both of these names can be found on various tools and machines that were made in the GDR. Due to the collective nature of East Germany's socialist economy, the products of many different factories contributed to the collective though, and many different items from different places had these labels. Some wrenches stick out like a sore thumb though. This wrench was made in the Soviet Union. And it will happen now and then that you find tools from Russia or Eastern European countries in East German collections. This wrench was apparently made in Slovenia. As you might know, the Germans and Austrians in particular couldn't help themselves to settle just about anywhere in Europe at one point. So of course this town also has a German name, Rötschach by Gonobitz. And guess what? That tool factory was founded by German-speaking engineers as it seems. At the time when this wrench was made, Slovenia was most probably still part of Yugoslavia though. Western Europeans tend to throw all Slavic people into one basket but Yugoslavia was not part of the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact. This here is also not a GDR product. Razol is short for Richard Abram Herder Solingen, a well-known German tool manufacturer. The town of Solingen, famous for knife making since the Middle Ages, is in Western Germany though. Since I don't really see any modern tools in this collection, I suppose that this wrench was either imported into the GDR or that it was in someone's possession before Germany was even divided. Razol as a brand existed way before World War II. Let's have a look at some of the other items then. On this chisel and on many other items we find the letters TGL. It is not a brand name, but it still tells you that this is a GDR product. TGL is the name of East Germany's system of standardization. You might have heard of DIN norms that you can find on West German products and DIN has also made its way into the names of things like DIN connectors and DIN sizes of sheets of paper like DIN A4. As you can probably tell by looking at East German names and products, the GDR was in many ways obnoxiously German. And here is another contradiction. As a socialist nation, it tried to appear as internationalist and a friend of the worker and the downtrodden everywhere, as an equal among a socialist brothers and sisters around the world. But at the same time, we are talking about Germans, which also often means being a stickler for rules. So of course, East Germany had an institute for standardization. These pliers, as well as these two hammers, have the Smalkalda logo as well. I'm sure though that there would have been various factories that made die forged tools at that time. 
and I simply don't know where exactly they were made. If you have any idea, feel free to let me know. This screwdriver reads Voltus, another East German brand name, and the folding ruler says Hoval, which is apparently the brand name of products made by VEB Pfeifen und Holzerzeugnisse, Bad Liebenstein, which means pipes and wood products at Bad Liebenstein. The German word Pfeife in this context means pipe, as in pipe smoking. As I said, these company names sometimes lead to misunderstandings. But what does the VEB or VEB in front of all these company names actually mean? Well, I will talk about that in just a minute. Now that we have taken a look at all these hand tools, how about we try to pick some power tools next? Here we have two rather heavy hammer drills and at least one of the two seems to be in really rough condition. They were both made by VEB Elektrowerkzeuge Eibenstock, quite literally, Power Tools Eibenstock, which is the name of a small town in Saxony. The letters VEB in front of all these names refer to a legal form that many companies in the GDR had. Volks eigener Betrieb, literally translated the people's own company, means that these are publicly owned enterprises as opposed to privately owned ones. For several decades, privately as well as publicly owned corporations existed alongside each other. When Erich Honecker took office in 1972, 11,000 private enterprises still existed, but were then nationalized by force. On some East German products, most probably from before that time, you might therefore find legal forms that are similar to Western corporations. With this model, in addition to the rough condition of the chuck, enclosure and power cord, this filter inside the handle is also broken. This is one of the most common faults in power tools and especially in power drills. The filter inside the other machine is still intact, but I often replace these parts even when they still appear to be okay. Here we can see the two interference suppression filters in comparison. People who watch my videos ask me about this all the time. Especially viewers who have never worked on old electronics before often expect me to tell them where they can find exact replacements for the broken parts. But that is usually not how it works. It's usually impossible to get that for old tools and certainly not for a low price. This might sound complicated, but it's actually not. The filter acts like a capacitor between line and neutral. And for that you use a class X capacitor. And in this particular case with 0.1 microfarads or 100 nanofarads of capacitance. In addition, you have essentially two class Y capacitors with 2500 picofarads or 2.5 nanofarads. Depending on the type of device they are used in, the common connection of the class Y capacitors connects to the stator pack or to protective earth which handheld power tools are usually not connected to. Since I don't have an exact replacement myself, I'm going to use this filter here. It has 70 instead of 100 nanofarads of capacitance for the class X capacitor, while the values for the two class Y caps are the same. If you are confused about the values you find on these components, or capacitors in general, at least over here the capacitances are usually in either picofarad or microfarad not in nanofarad. If a value is very small, like 0.1, it must be microfarads, because 0.1 picofarads is a ridiculously small capacitance. The two leads in the power cord, for example, will have probably more than that capacitance by simply running side by side. While 2500 microfarads would be a really large capacitance that you might find in a low voltage electrolytic capacitor, but not in a class Y capacitor that is rated for the line voltage. Generally speaking, once you have found a suppressor that is rated for at least the line voltage in your particular country, chances are that the capacitances will be around the same values you see here. In my experience, a little more or less shouldn't be a problem. Usually a broken filter will create a short circuit that will make your circuit breaker trip. Removing the filter is the first step. The machine can be run without a filter by connecting the power directly to the motor. It's better to have a line filter though, but if you can't find one, maybe just connect a 100 nanofarad class X capacitor or something in that ballpark between line and neutral. In this particular case, the new filter doesn't have the exact dimensions of the old one. So I use a little bit of glue to hold it in place.
The brushes on this machine also need to be replaced. Not only is not a lot of material left, the copper wire that used to be connected to the brush is broken and I think there was a short circuit in the past that caused that copper wire to melt. Not a good sign at all. After cleaning the drill a little more from the outside and removing the chuck which is fastened with a Morse cone like in a lathe or professional drill press, I also pull apart the gearbox to take a look at the gears and grease and also the rotor. Unfortunately the commutator is severely damaged and some windings on the rotor have overheated as well. This is something that is beyond reasonable repair. But since I really happen to like these Eibenstock drills I bought several of them and also some that were already ripped apart so I was able to get my hands on a used replacement rotor that we will insert here. I also got new old replacement brushes. In the meantime most of the plastic parts go into the ultrasonic cleaner. The EcoFlow station is visible in some of the shots here, but this is not a sponsored video. I was simply still testing that unit when I filmed this particular repair job. I then also clear out the old grease. It's sometimes hard to tell if it's still okay. And here's another question that people ask all the time. Which lubricant slash replacement grease do you use in power tools? Let me give you one simple and one complicated answer. Short answer. I found this Makita gear grease that should be available all around the world and you can probably use that. Long answer. It depends on the application. Not all gears on power tools spin at the same speed and that will kind of determine which viscosity at room temperature that lubricant should probably have. The two most common cases are probably drills and angle grinders. Angle grinder gears spin faster than the ones inside a power drills gearbox and therefore the ideal lubricant is probably a different one. This German website called Winkelschleifer Test, Angle Grinder Test, has this to say about it. NLGI is short for National Lubricating Grease Institute. The NLGI rates the consistency of lubricant on a scale from 6 meaning very hard to triple zero meaning fluid. The recommendation for angle grinders on that website is to take a lubricant of the class 0, double zero or triple zero. While I would expect that a power drill will be shifted a little more to the middle of that scale. The blue stuff that I'm using is type EP2 grease which is NLGI class 2 being in the middle of the scale with a power cord, filter, rotor, brushes and grease replaced the chuck is put into the acid bath after I had already tried to clean it manually and after waiting for a day or two I put the two power drills back together. lighter but also probably produced and sold in higher numbers than the Eibenstock hammer drills were these and similar power drills of VEB Elektrowerkzeuge Sebnitz also sold under the Smalkalda brand name. Here in grey the well-known HBM 250 and in brown HBM 450 and here are some pictures of an older generation of power tools that were made by that company. And similar to what we saw in my video about the Metabo multi-tool I did some years ago and other similar systems from West Germany, a number of attachments existed for these power drills, some of which must seem rather desperate from today's perspective. Inside the HBM 250 we find once again a very similar filter that is also starting to come apart as it seems. The repairs necessary are exactly the same as with the Eibenstock drills. The next item I have here is a jigsaw of yet another manufacturer. VEB Spezialwerkzeuge Neustadt, meaning something like Special Purpose Tools Neustadt. 
Upon removing the handle and brushing off some old sawdust, you can see that in this instance they literally just connected single capacitors to the motor. They should be replaced as well. Inside the gearbox we find this brown lubricant that is still rather stiff in parts, but in other places seems to liquefy. I remove it as good as I can and apply new grease. After putting the saw back together, I encountered yet another problem though. My modern saw blades don't fit. But as luck would have it, among more than 80 million people in this country, there always seems to be that one guy who never threw grandpa's old stuff away, but rather put it on eBay. So I was able to purchase this box here. It says VEB Technische Messer Berlin im VEB Werkzeugkombinat Schmalkalden. Technical knives or edges, Berlin. Part of the tool combine Schmalkalden. Handling old tools is one thing, but actually opening a box of material or replacement parts that came in the original packaging truly feels like time traveling to me. By the way, while this video is being published, I'm actually no longer in Germany. I'm currently on a trip through Mexico and I will be here until the end of March. I already produced some videos that will be uploaded during my stay here. But if you live in Mexico or if you happen to currently also travel the country and you want to meet, please contact me. Send me an email at inventordonations at gmail.com and we can talk about that. I will not name any specific dates or places here in public, but I will be mostly in the southern part of Mexico and won't come anywhere near the northern border. I will also spend some time in Mexico City and I could certainly still use some local contacts there and other places around Mexico. So feel free to send me that email. Back to the GDR though, we move on to the next item. I first thought that this was an angle grinder, but it appears to be a polishing machine as you can see by looking at the original packaging here. And the unusual angle and the relatively low rotational speed also kind of give it away. It was also made by Eibenstock, which by the way still makes power drills and as it seems also the official successor of this old GDR tool here. Unfortunately a piece of plastic that used to act as a push button sitting directly on the actual on off switch has fallen off. Upon opening the handle and cleaning the insides with a paintbrush, I glue that piece of plastic back on with some super glue. Some insulating tape is used to hold it in place until the glue is dried. It is rather obvious that they were smart enough to simply reuse some of the same parts in here they also installed in the power drills. Also the same kind of filter which we will once again remove. The filter reads RFT and RFT stands for Rundfunk und Fernmeldetechnik, Broadcasting and Telecommunications Technology. And it was not the name of a specific company, but rather a sort of brand name that many companies from the radio, TV and electronic sector of the GDR contributed to. In some places, the power cord also has some rather obvious damage. And since this tool doesn't have the typical 90 degree angle of a normal angle grinder, we also find a mechanism quite different from the typical bevel gears in here. Anyway, after installing a new filter and patching and repairing the old power cord, we are ready for a test. Since I don't have a polishing disc at hand, we'll have to use it more like a typical angle grinder though. And maybe one GDR tool can take care of another one. The old BAT toolbox is generally speaking in good condition. It even came with these inlays to protect the box from the inside. There is some rust on the bottom though 
and I can use the wire wheel to remove loose paint and rust before treating the bottom of the box with some citric acid as well. In fact, I still have more East German tools and boxes lying around and I will certainly take care of them as well and you will encounter them again in the future. Another field that I'm currently getting into are small engines and electric generators of East German production and of the East German armed forces. It might still take a while, but this will definitely play a role in future episodes. As always, I hope that you liked this video. And if that was the case, I would appreciate it if you would give it a like. This is really what keeps me going, guys. If you want to help more actively in the production of future videos, you can make a donation via PayPal. A link for that is down in the video description. Or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.